Grace and peace to you from God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to worship here at Westminster Presbyterian Church. I already said it last service, but Sue, fantastic offer to a prelude today. Thank you. Um, we're so thankful for her. Uh, hey, welcome. We are here because God's on a mission to save this world. And he's on a mission by, and his, his, his plan is to gather together a community of missionaries. That's what we call the church. People who truly know God, have a relationship with him. People who are growing more and more like Jesus Christ. So we can share his love and his good news with this world. Around here we call that know Christ, grow in Christ, and go in Christ. Welcome. We, uh, if you're new among us today, a special welcome to you. I realize it can be hard to get up and come to a group of people you don't know, so thank you for doing that. Uh, after this service, at each entrance, we will have somebody with a basket of goodie bags. If you are new, claim your goodie bag. It has information about the church for you. For all of us, I invite you to find your, um, your connection card and fill that out. If we know you, put your name on it. If we don't know you, uh, give us as much information as you're comfortable giving us. I'd love connecting with new people. And uh, put that in the offering later on in the service. You'll notice it's still that green color. I want to say a huge thanks to everybody who has told us where, where they currently serve um, on the back. My goodness, we had, Chris told me there were four pages of places that people at Westminster are volunteering. So clearly our people are out in the community making a positive difference for the kingdom. Thank you for letting us know. That sort of helps us get prepared for, for Mission May. If you haven't gotten to do that yet, you know, you can put yours down. If you already have, I don't need it again. Um, that'll be late, uh, in the offering later in the service. One neat ministry that's just starting up, uh, some people that, that we've known have been involved with it, is Knox Classical Academy. Paul, come on down. Paul Shoemaker is going to tell us more about it. Yeah, microphone right there. Good morning. My name is Paul Shoemaker, and I'm here representing Knox Classical Academy. Ben and Heather McReynolds, former members here, are launching a classical school in the fall, and we've set up two informational tables out in the foyer. And if you're wondering what, what is classical education, it's a great way for your children or grandchildren to be educated. So we'd like you to come out, uh, introduce yourselves to us, ask any questions you may have. We're looking to launch with kindergarten, first, and second grade in the fall. It's a great opportunity for your children to get a Christ-centered education. And when they come out at the end, they will probably speak Latin and be wonderful little uh, defenders of the faith and have the ability to know what they believe, defend what they believe and why they believe it, and just be really good citizens of this world as we sojourn through to glory. So I appreciate your time, and I would ask you to stop by our tables out in the foyer. Thank you. Paul, thanks so much. Latin. I never learned Latin. Wow. Um, in, in terms of announcements, the two I want to highlight, if you are kind of new to Westminster, and I'm going to let you define what kind of new is, um, so first time visitors to have been here for a little while, we do have a welcome lunch. Uh, we do it every couple of months, and, and we're having one today. You are certainly welcome to come and just have lunch. It's right after this service. In the, um, in the worship hall, uh, just an opportunity for us to talk about how could we help advance your spiritual journey of faith. So that's right after this. Um, and also, hey, the, over the Lenten series, we had text messages. Over 125 people signed up for text uh, devotionals each day during the Lenten series. And I thought that was just going to be during a Lent thing. But after Lent, there were so many people who said, we love those text devos, and some who didn't, but the most people. And so we said, well, we can keep doing those. If you want to get uh, on the text devo thing, um, talk to me. I will help you get hooked up with that. If you want to stop it, anytime you can all just reply stop. But, it's, um, but they're actually starting up tomorrow again to keep going, and they will be, they're separate for traditional and, conservative, and contemporary. So the... They'll just be related to the sermon series in the traditional services. That's enough for the announcements. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious God, we praise you for who you are. Jesus, in this series, we've been talking about how you're the Christ and the bread of life and the light of the world. God, be light to us today. 
as we um, sing your praise, as we offer our prayers, as we study your word, as we go from this place, help us to reflect your light so that we can see that you're the light of the world and others can see that we are the light of the world. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I know that my Redeemer lives. In the end, he will stand upon the earth. Even after my skin is destroyed, yet I will see God with my own eyes. How, How my heart, heart yearns within me. And let us sing that great Easter hymn, I know that my Redeemer lives. good to remember that we are in the season of Eastertide. And the season, of course, began with the cross where Jesus died for our sins. Let's come to God with our prayers of confession, admitting our need for God's grace. We'll pray first together with these words and then on our own. Let's pray. Resurrected Lord, you are the light of the world, and you call us to be the light of the world. Yet too often we prefer darkness. We try to keep our sins in shadow. We hold on to dark anger and black grudges. We sometimes shroud our faith in front of others. And in so doing, we hide your light from the world. Forgive us, Jesus. May we shine forth, not our own goodness, but how much we have been forgiven. May we shine like the greatest of us and share with the world that we might be the light of the world. Mm -hmm. 
Amen. Friends, hear this good news from Acts 26. God's desire is to open our eyes, to turn us from darkness to light. That we may receive the forgiveness of sins. And to place among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Thanks be to God. Today, as you may have gathered, we're talking about Jesus as the light of the world. It's a light of God's presence and a light of guidance. And so we're going to sing together hymn number 598, All the Way My Savior Leads Me. Remain seated for this.
And let's come to this God in prayer. Here, Jesus, we're about to read where you declare that you are the light of the world, and Lord, you know we need it. We so often walk in darkness. You created our eyes to see not things as they are, but only light reflected off of them. And so often the light we see reflected is sunlight or more commonly artificial light. And in the light of this world, we see so many challenges. We watch the news and cry. We see people around us who have such massive challenges, health challenges, I see in the prayer requests some big ones. See people living in grief, some living in poverty and homelessness around us, and a city and a nation and a world that don't always know what to do with the challenges that we face in the light that we see. But we know, God, that you are the light of the world. Jesus Christ, shine your light into our eyes so we may see the world not in the artificial light of this earth, but reflected through the light of you. Because we know that through the light of the world, you are active. You are at work even now in the political world. You're at work even now in the, polit in the business world. You're at work in education and in all the arenas of life. You're at work in our lives. God, help us to see it. May we see our lives and our neighbors and our community and our nation and our world through the light of of the gospel. May we see what you are doing in this world so that we can take our role in it, so that we can join our prayers with the voice of the Holy Spirit. God, open our eyes to the light of the world. Keep us from being distracted by all the flashing lights around us to see your light that we may follow. As we come to your holy word, open our eyes through your Holy Spirit that we may see how it speaks into our lives so we can speak into your world. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, Jesus who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. We are continuing this sermon series, I Am. Right? Talking about who Jesus is. There are a whole lot of different people in our world who have different opinions about who Jesus might be. So we're looking at who Jesus said he is. Uh, two weeks ago on Easter, we looked at Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ and what it means to be Christ. Last week, we looked at Jesus' statement, I am the bread of life. This week, I am the light of the world. I'm going to read from a longer passage. There's a story that was inserted into the middle. I'm going to skip over that part, so we're going to have a, some from the beginning and some from later on, so follow along with me. We're in John, starting in chapter 7, verse 37. On the last day of the feast, that is the Feast of Tabernacles, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the Scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believe in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not yet been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, This really is the prophet. Others said, This is the Christ. But some said, Is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the Scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. I'm going to skip down to chapter 8, verse 12. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, 
You're bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going, but you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The light of the world. That's what Jesus says here. I have to say, when I hear that phrase, the light of the world, I'm reminded of an old story I heard years and years ago. Uh, of It was an admiral on a battleship out at night one night, on, out on maneuvers. This is in the days long before satellite GPS navigation. And on this foggy night, they saw a, a light out in the distance, and they realized they're on a collision course, right? He thinks there's probably some fishing boat out there, and we would just run right over it. So he tells his ensign, ensign, radio over to that guy and, and tell him to veer off. Well, the guy radioed back, you veer off. Well, now this admiral was used to giving orders, not used to taking orders. And so he told his ensign, ensign, tell him I am an admiral. Tell him to veer off. Came the reply back, well, I, I used to be a seaman second class. You veer off. Well, at this point, the admiral's getting a little incensed, so he took the radio himself and he said, this is a battleship. You veer off. Came the reply, this is a lighthouse. <laughs> Guess who veered off? You know, light means such different things to different people, right? And, and in different ways. I, I look at a lighthouse, shows a light for safety, right? Show you where the rocks are. Sometimes light can mean knowledge, you know, the age of enlightenment. Light can mean spiritual awareness. You know, Buddhists talk of, of Buddhist enlightenment. Light can mean life, right? Sunlight gives life to the plants, and we get that energy through eating them and eating the animals that ate them. You know, you know how that works. Sometimes light can be comfort. You know, it was Robert Louis Stevenson who, who said that when he was a child, he was afraid of the dark, but there was a man who came and, and lit the gas lights, the street lights, by hand uh, on his street, and he said it was cutting holes in the darkness. Isn't that a great phrase? Cutting holes in the darkness. Light can mean all these different things. In, in some way, Jesus could mean all of those about himself, right? He is uh, spiritual awareness. He is life. He is knowledge. He is a hole in our darkness. But I think Jesus had a very specific meaning here. And it, we take it from the context in which he spoke. The, the first verse here uh, says that Jesus was in the feast. Now, this is the Feast of Tabernacles. I have to say, the Feast of Tabernacles is not one of those feasts that we Christians remember a whole lot about. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands for who could tell me all about the Feast of Tabernacles. Well, some of us probably could. But the, um, the Feast of Tabernacles is one of three major festivals in the Jewish year, uh, Tabernacles and Pentecost and Passover. Um, it remembered when the Israelites were on the journey to the promised land in the wilderness, right? God had, had freed them from slavery in Egypt uh, with all the plagues, take them through the Red Sea, and then they had this period of wilderness, 40 years in the wilderness as God brought them to the promised land. And the, the festival, the Feast of Tabernacles, also called Booths, is a time when, when they remembered every year we were in the wilderness and God led us to the promised land. And to remember that, God told them to go camping. Really? They, they left their houses and they stayed in tents, not RVs, because that's not really camping. If, if you bring a house with wheels with you, that's not really camping. Okay, that's my own personal pet peeve, but anyway. But yeah, so they were, they were out in tents, and so they would have this trip, to rem this tent experience, or booths, or tabernacles to remember uh, the time out in the wilderness. Now, in the wilderness, the, the first challenge they had was the lack of water, right? They were thirsty. Uh, so they, they were praising God to get them through the Red Sea, but in a couple of days, hey, we need water. And God did a miracle. God made water come, a, a stream of water come from a rock and uh, fed all the people, or watered all the people. Um, and here, Jesus, on the last day of the feast, what this says, the grand day of the feast, is where Jesus stands up and says, 
If anyone thirsts, let him come to me. As the, whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So God made a river of water flow, but whoever is thirsty, come to me. I'm the one who gives the stream of water. And then, of course, in the wilderness, the other really key distinctive feature of that wilderness was that God led them. God was with them. They had a pillar of cloud and fire. Exodus chapter 13 says they had a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. It was the symbol of God's presence with them, and it was God's presence guiding them. So wherever the pillar of fire led, that's where they went. When the pillar of fire stopped, that's where they stopped. That's where they camped. The pillar was with them. It was God's presence, God's guidance with them. And I think that's what Jesus is thinking about when here at this festival he declares, I am the light of the world. That here we wandered in the, we were in the wilderness. We shouldn't even say they wandered in the wilderness. They followed God in the wilderness. God was with us. God was guiding us. I am the light of the world. Think about what that light must have meant to those Israelites. I mean, they had grown up in slavery. They and their parents, their grandparents, their great-grandparents for hundreds of years had grown up in slavery in Egypt. And they'd grown up with these stories about a God who called their people, right, called Abraham and Isaac and Joseph and Jacob and Joseph and, and had called them and had a promise for them and told them to live in the promised land, but they left. Right? They left to go to Egypt where the, where the food was better and they got enslaved. And so they may have wondered, has this God abandoned us? Remember, they don't know much about God. They, they knew a lot of stories about these Egyptian gods. And if you look at all the stories about the Egyptian gods, those Egyptian gods were crazy. Like if you read Egyptian mythology, those gods were nuts. A whole lot like Greek and Roman mythology. They were capricious. They did whatever they wanted. They were not beneficial gods. And so these people may have wondered, who is this God like? Has he abandoned us? But no, there he is. There's the pillar of the cloud and the fire. We can see his light. We are living in his light. We know that God is with us. Think what that light must have meant to them. And of course it was guidance. That in this journey, God's leading us to the promised land, but None of them had ever been there. None of their leaders had ever been there. They'd never met anyone who had ever been there, and they did not have a map. How are we going to get to this promised land? Well, we'll just follow God, right? We don't have to figure our way out. We don't have to know our way. We simply need to follow God. And isn't that true in our lives too? There's so many different people can give you advice, so many different ideas that you could follow. We can follow our emotions we can follow our own intellect. We can follow so many different people. But what we need to be doing is following God. That will lead us to the promised land He has for us, to the life that God created us for. In this journey of life, we need to follow God. Jesus is the light of the world. But here's what really blows me away about that, that wilderness period. Sometimes the people praised God. And when they praised God, the pillar was right there. And sometimes the people grumbled. And when they grumbled, the pillar was still right there. Sometimes they followed exactly what they were supposed to be doing and they were just amazed by God's presence, like when God gave them the Ten Commandments and they were praising God. And sometimes they pretended as if God wasn't there. They made this, this golden calf. And both times the pillar, the pillar was still there. Sometimes they followed exactly where God told them to go, and sometimes we even see periods of rebellion, Korah's rebellion and some other ones, in the time there. And both times of goodness and in times of rebellion, the pillar was right there. God's presence was with them, guiding them, leading them toward the promised land. Even when they turned away from the promised land, said, we don't trust God to lead us in, the pillar was still there. For the next 40 years, every single day, God's presence, God's guidance was there. And isn't that true in our lives too? Praise God. Sometimes we see God with us and we are in tune with God, we're praising God, and sometimes we are grumbling. Sometimes we are sinning and even rebelling. Sometimes we are doubting. And all of those times, Jesus is still the light of the world. 
He's still the light for our lives. He's still there. And he's still guiding us toward the promised land. Even when we don't see it. Even when we don't recognize it. You know, it, it strikes me, there are a lot of times in Israel's history, they totally didn't recognize, in, just in this, in this journey through the wilderness, they didn't even recognize God was there. Uh, in my own personal Bible studies right now, in my daily, uh, daily time in the Word, I'm in Deuteronomy. And here, it blew me away as I was writing this sermon, I realized, when in Deuteronomy do they talk about the pillar of cloud and fire? It gets three mentions in the whole book. Three, in three different verses. The whole trip, it was there, but it only gets mentioned three times. If you were telling the journey of your life, if you were writing your life story, where would God get a mention? Because, you know, it strikes me, a lot of people could tell their whole life story and not even mention God, or just mention Him in three verses. Sometimes we do that. Like, I can tell you my story of, of, you know, I got born and I went to school and I, you know, graduated, got a career, got married, had kids, I moved to these different places. I can tell you the stories of, of, you know, things that I've accomplished or challenges that I've overcome, hurts that I've endured. But in all of that, we need to ask the question, where's God? Because we could tell the story without Him, or we could tell the story with God leading us all the way. Because the light is there. Jesus is the light of the world. He's in your life story. Can you see that? Some people, when they tell their life story, the, the highlights would be the choices that they've made. Right? I decided to do this. I decided this career. I decided on this spouse. I decided on this, that, or the other thing. That some, some people's life story would focus on their choices. Some people's life story might focus on their accomplishments or, or challenges they've overcome. Some people, as they tell their life story, it focuses on the traumas, the hurts, the pains that they've gone through, and that's a central part of their story. And in each of these, where is God? Is He in your story? Is He the center of your story? Because Jesus is there. In your times of greatest triumph, Jesus was there. I wonder if you recognize that or just thanked yourself. In your times of greatest challenge, Jesus was there. In the times of your greatest failures, even your sins, Jesus is there, still a sign of God's presence, still trying to lead you to the promised land. When you're going through traumas in your own life, think back of your own history. Where was Jesus? Was it a time you'd actually walked away from him? Or was it possible that God was taking you through this time like God led them through the wilderness in order to get you to the promised land he had for you? Let me just invite you this week, maybe even this afternoon, take some time and think through your life story and ask the question, where was Jesus? Right? How would I tell the story with Jesus? Because I think... He wants to transform our life story. He wants to, to change our life story from a wandering in the wilderness to a journey to the promised land. Right? Sometimes we tell our life story as in, here's the places I've been and the things I've seen and things I've done. It's my wanderings. But, but if we have Jesus at the center of the story, we realize this life is not a wandering. This life is a journey to the promised land and Jesus is there in my life leading me to that promised land. Can you see it? Can you thank him for it? This week, even today, take some time and think through where is Jesus in your life story? Uh, there was a man in the last century named E. Stanley Jones. Are you all familiar at all with E. Stanley Jones? Maybe some of us are. Not enough. This is one of the greatest guys in the last century. He is known as the Billy Graham of India. He was a missionary, Methodist missionary to India, uh, personal friends with Gandhi. He is like one of the few non-Indians to win the Gandhi Peace Prize. Uh, he was nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, made a huge impact on the nation of India as it was uh, building and as and, and the whole missionary movement. He's just an amazing guy, wrote something like 30 books, one of the books he's best known for is his autobiography. It's called A Song of Ascents. Ascents, like, you know, climbing up. Um, in the introduction, he tells us, 
that it was his third attempt at an autobiography. He decided to sit down and read, write the story of his life as he was sort of heading into retirement. And he, he wrote the story of his life, all the events that he had been through and the things that he had done and, and what God had done through him. He gave credit to God where credit was due. But at the end of the book, he, he looked at it, he read it over, and he says, this book is going to help people know me better. But it's not going to help people know God better. And he threw it out. Never published it. Then he tried again. And he wrote a more philosophical book about, about the things that he'd experienced and what he had learned. Things he had learned along his life's journey that he thinks other people can learn. But again, at the end of the book, he decided to throw it away. Never published it. And the third time, he was age 83 at this point. At age 83, he realized that the central event of his life happened 1,900 years before he was born. The central event of his life was the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. And everything else in his existence had flowed out of what God had done for him on the cross and the empty tomb. And so that's where he starts. And the rest of the book is talking about how his life is really an outpouring of what God has done. Transformed how he viewed his life with Christ, not just at, not just getting three verses mentioned. Not just getting thanks along the way, but as the central guiding principle of who I am. I am who I am because Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave and therefore I live. It's a magnificent book, A Song of Ascents. I'd recommend it to you. Could you write that book? As you're telling your own life journey, where is God in that journey? How would you include him in the story? But you know, maybe I should turn that question around. The real question I should ask is, how would God write your biography? How would God write your life story? It's not just a rhetorical question because one day, of course, God will be reading your biography. I love the scene at the end of, of Revelation chapter 20, that great prophecy of the great white throne. That one day God gathers all the dead to him. He sits down on the throne and books are open. It's a book on each of our lives. And it says the dead are judged according to what's in the books. And some people have this fear, oh, it's just everything bad I've ever done. But it does not say that. Maybe, maybe it's a biography. Maybe it's the story of your life as God has written it down. What's in that book for you? I wonder if God would write the story of our life very differently from how I might tell the story of my life. Right? As, as I'm telling the story of my life, I, I mark some of my moves as kind of the, the key events, right? Graduation here or, or moving across the country. Maybe those are things that I would consider major events in my life. But to God, those might be minor. They might just get a brief mention or not at all. I wonder if God was telling the story of your life, if, if he'd devote a whole chapter to a conversation you had once with somebody who was going through a hard time and, and you offered to pray with them. And they didn't tell you, but they hadn't prayed in a long time. And your prayer with them started them on a journey toward faith. I wonder if that conversation would get a whole chapter in your biography, even if you barely remember the conversation. I wonder if God might, might include a story of a time when you felt really tempted by something and, and God knew that if you'd given in to that temptation, it would lead you down a path toward addiction or toward a real brokenness in your life and your relationships. But on that day, you turned to the Holy Spirit and He filled you with strength and you walked away from that temptation. Maybe something you wouldn't even remember because it was a non-event, right? An event that did not happen. But I wonder if some of those non-events are some of the most significant moments in our lives. Is it possible that from God's perspective, some of the most significant events in our lives are things we barely remember? That we don't even know the outcome of some of our actions? I was reading uh, recently in this book, Switch, of uh, a couple that was in marriage therapy. Their, their marriage was not well. Uh, 
the spark was gone in the relationship and they were arguing all the time. They're just arguing, arguing, bickering over small things. And they were in marriage therapy, but it didn't look good. It looked like they were heading toward divorce. And one morning, the husband woke up early and he decided to make coffee. It's an unusual thing because he didn't really drink coffee every morning, but his wife did. And he thought, well, maybe today it would be nice to have some coffee. So he just made coffee. And his wife, she, she woke up that morning to the smell of coffee and she came downstairs and, and, and had a cup of coffee and she said, thank you. And they chatted a little bit, had a cup of coffee together, and it was normal. Didn't suddenly fix anything in their relationship, but they thought, each of them in their own heads independently, you know, this is nice, just having a normal cup of coffee. Maybe we can do this. And it started them on a journey toward healing and forgiveness. And to the day, they're still married. I bet in God's biography of each of them, that cup of coffee is going to get a mention. And yet, it's something so small, something I might not even think to include in a biography. How many of our significant changes of our lives are things we barely remember? Of course, as God is telling your biography, I think maybe he'd tell it to start with the cross as well. Right? This is someone who I created. This is someone who I formed. And yes, they're part of the human rebellion, but it's someone for whom I died. And I rose again to give them eternal life. As God is telling the story of your life, I wonder if he'd tell it something like that festival of tabernacles. This is a person who was wandering in the wilderness, but I was there. A light in their world. And here are the places where they recognized me. Here are the places where they followed. Here are the places where I was leading them toward the promised land. God changes our life history from just a wandering in the wilderness into a journey toward the promised land. This week, let me invite you. Think through your life story. Ask, how would I tell it with Jesus at the center? With Jesus as the light of my world? How might God tell my life story? Remember, when we can see him and when we can't, Jesus is the light of the world. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for being present to us. Even when the sky is covered in clouds, the sun is still the light, giving life and light to this world. God, help us to see you, to see you before us leading our journey, to see you showing us that you are here, and help us to be a sign of your presence in this world. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. Well, today, before the offering, we do have a, a celebration we are going to recognize the people who have been elected to be new officers at Westminster Presbyterian Church. Um, I'm going to invite all of the new officers to come forward at this time, as they've already done in the last service. Now, we're not going to ask all the questions of ordination and installation again in each service, because they've already vowed to do these things. They've already said yes at the 9 o'clock service. But we are going to recognize them because these are the leaders of the whole church, not just the leaders of the 9 o'clock service. Um, and I am going to ask you to take... Well, perhaps I've lost it. Amy, is there a sheet over there, a manila sheet? Now, why did I put it there? Thank you so much. Um, and we are going to ask you to say your vows for, for them. But... We just need to recognize, we Presbyterians have a great tradition of the priesthood of all believers. We don't just believe that some people are called to be priests. We do believe that every Christian is called to be a priest, someone who connects God to the world. And, and one of the ways we live that out is by ordaining our officers, our elders and our deacons and our pastors. So the vows that these guys took uh, just at the 9 o'clock service were the same vows I took when I was ordained as a minister. Uh, we do believe that God calls each of us to service, some of us to different specific roles. 
And so these guys have been ordained and installed, but we'd recognize that they are the officers of this congregation. So I'm going to ask all of us here to, uh, to take vows to them. I'm going to ask you a do you question, and we're all going to respond with a hearty yes. All right? So do we, the covenant partners of this congregation, accept these elders and deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ, according to the word of God and the constitution of ECO, do we? Yes! And do we agree to pray for them, to encourage them, to respect their decisions, and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ who alone is head of the church, do we? Yes! That was a hearty yes. Well done. Well, another thing we do is we do pray for these leaders, as we just vowed to do. I'm going to invite all of the uh, either currently serving or resting elders and deacons of this congregation to come forward and lay hands on these. Um, you've already been ordained, so I'm not going to ask anybody to kneel. Which some of you are thinking, thank you. But uh, I'm invite all, all the current, uh, all the elders and deacons to come forward, whether you are uh, currently serving or, or have served in the past. We can introduce them. Why, why don't you introduce yourself? As uh, it, we've already elected them, so why don't you introduce yourself? Ellen, start us off. Okay. Ellen Williams. As deacon. That's right. I'm Deacon Anita Schopenhauer. Dorothy Powell, Deacon. Deacon Sharon Tangle. Norm Bear, Deacon. Ed Nicholson, Elder. Dick Guile, Elder. Larry Higby, Elder. Amy Bell, Elder. Fantastic. Thank you, Kayleen. She was just, oh, there she is. Okay. Well, let's have a prayer over you people. God, we do give you thanks. That it was from the time of Moses in the wilderness when you called people to be leaders to take some burden off of Moses. And since then, you have called leaders to lead your people in every generation. We thank you for the generations of leaders who have walked this church to this place. And we pray for these new leaders. May the elders give them vision. Vision to see uh, the promised land that you were leading us toward. Give them vision so that we may take our role in advancing your kingdom in this valley and across this world and help us to follow. Lord, for these deacons, give them vision of a community of love, a community that reflects uh, the love that Jesus Christ himself has for us. Give them uh, the strength and the fortitude and the imagination to help us be the best community of faith we can be. And in all of this, Lord, help us to follow them as we follow you. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. So, a great welcome to our elders and deacons. Let's uh, give them a, a round of thanks. As a response to what God has given us, we always have an opportunity to give back. We'll now bring the morning offering.
God, we do offer you all praise for being a God who is with us, for being a God who does guide us. Lord, take this act of thanksgiving and use it for your kingdom in this place and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn, the words are just a natural. It's 608. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. you this week consider your life journey the perspective of jesus if you have any prayer need for yourself or for someone else we have a prayer minister over here who just love to speak and pray with you friends go out into this world following the light of the world and being the light of the world to others amen <laughs>